On the sixth episode of our GSL chat chamber, we welcome Laura Sliep, who is managing partner at Cobbled. He's attorney at law and expert in constitutional, commercial, and civil law questions. He's also a visiting lecturer at RGSL since the beginnings of foundation of RGSL. We discuss topics as justice, peace, morals and ethics, healthy habits, but most importantly, the recent constitutional court case regarding same-sex work leave. Congratulations, this is the... I don't know which episode. Sixth. We can start again, please. <laughs> <laughs> we just, uh, I, I said that I wouldn't like to uh, mention the number of episodes anymore because you can, you know, sometimes just mix up. All right. Hello, this is the chat chamber of RGSL. We are very pleased to be welcoming Laura Sliepa, who is a very known advocate who is working in Cobalt. He is also a visiting lecturer. And uh, yeah, we are very ha happy to be here. Yes, hello. Good to see you. And happy to be invited. Very nice. So today with you are, as well as always, Christopher and Marta. And I have a tendency to start our um, podcast with a quote. And this time I would like to refer to Marcus Aurelius. And he has said that if it is not right, do not do it. If it is not true, do not say it. How does this quote resonate to you as we are addressing the field of law? Because we know that there are cases which are controversial, the truth for each party is different. How do you see this um, in terms of law? Well, thank you for um, uh, a tough question, and indeed um, not an easy one to answer. Uh, let me um, um, put it in a uh, the following uh, sort of branches. First of all, I would like to say that Marcus Aurelius is not a simple Roman emperor. Um, his thoughts are there to me for many reasons. I had um, read his, um, um, his thesis during my times of my studies, and uh, I had found that this is not only an immortal advice on how one should treat uh, oneself and also in um, relationships with other people, but it is also important uh, to um, retain common sense uh, in uh, hard times, such as, as an example, the COVID, COVID pandemic. Um, I have not uh, revisited Marcus Aurelius uh, over uh, this uh, turbulent year, but I am sure that I would find a number of um, suggestions that would strengthen uh, my current position, and I believe, uh, in particular, his suggestions of always maintaining only the necessary, uh, uh, only, only that necessary part that is important to you, to your today's uh, life, and as you precisely quoted, uh, not to do anything that you yourself would not be convinced of a right thing to do. Um, ironically, when one of my best friends got uh, wrongfully uh, accused and got in prison, um, he was uh, uh, detained uh, for a few weeks while the investigation was ongoing, and I thought, I have a, a chance to visit him, and what should I bring with me to him? Uh, and I thought uh, uh, the uh, Marcus Aurelius thesis would be the ones that would uh, definitely best um, correspond to the situation in which uh, a man wrongfully accused could uh, find the strength, could find an inspiration to live true that uh, a rather complicated situation, both in terms of physical uh, context in which uh, a person is, is placed. That was in mid-90s, and you could imagine the conditions of, of prisons in Latvia were not uh, too comfortable. And also mentally, more importantly, mentally. And after his experience in detention, um, when returning back, he suggested that uh, the book uh, and, and thesis helped him enormously because they uh, helped him to calibrate his feelings and his understanding that although there is a great injustice done to him and things might not be always uh, in balance, as uh, we would expect for our uh, harmonious uh, existence. Nevertheless, when you think about it from the broader perspective, when you look at your miserable condition in the longer stretch, 
you might feel that this is probably yet another test to your humanity. So um, uh, that helped him enormously. And since then, many years have passed, and I believe that it still might be true that uh, at times of difficulties, uh, what Marcus Aurelius is teaching us um, is a very helpful, um, uh, let me put it in modern terms, it's a f helpful life hack. So the way how you approach things, how you uh, live through your rather difficult uh, life. But then uh, in a concrete response uh, to your question, I may add that uh, I would be extremely happy that if at the end of the day I would be able to say, yes, I have maintained uh, this uh, condition, I've maintained uh, to, to, I've, I've uh, kept myself to this rule that I've only done those things that I'm convinced of. And uh, especially when we talk about legal practice, that is not very uh, easy to follow, uh, because if you would uh, look back um, hundred, uh, hundreds of years, and let me quote uh, a regulation of Riga City Council, a regulation for lawyers uh, dating back to 1643, that suggests that lawyers should not take a case where they would not be convinced that this is a just case. So lawyers should only take those clients and those cases where lawyers are feeling that, that, that uh, their position would not contradict the consciousness. Uh, they would be convinced that the client case is right. Can you apply this uh, thesis to the today's complicated world? I believe yes. Uh, to some extent, of course, you realize that your client might not have committed the best possible action, and that might be also, to some extent, resorting to crime. In the same time, you would clearly understand that clients, whatever their deeds are, they also deserve legal protection, and they deserve basic human rights related uh, and emanating from the due process of law. And this is, of course, the thesis how modern-day advocates can live through maintaining that um, idealistic uh, approach of 1643 uh, Riga City Council regulation. You try to always make it as just as possible. Well, um, I believe you're right, because you cannot in a long term operate uh, serving injustice. Mm -hmm. You can, um, for a short while, for a specific situation, you could perhaps um, make a compromise with the consciousness. You could say, well, in this case, I could take the case even if I don't trust it. But you cannot build your practice, you cannot build your life on constant compromises like that. That's not even a compromise. That's actually um, uh, going against your own consciousness, going against your sense of lying, justice. Lying to yourself. Indeed, lying to yourself, and you could say for a moment, well, this is uh, a, a white lie situation, I need to do this because of some higher uh, needs, because of uh, a good uh, purpose, because uh, there is a, a good aim why I'm doing it. But of course, you have to always balance that what you do and your activities should always, uh, should not cross that uh, line where you would yourself say, well, this was wrong, this was not okay. You touched upon uh, your friend when we talked about Marcus Aurelius and that you recommended him this book during this tough time. But is there a book for you specifically that motivated you at some point or in some way um, helped you to go through tough times or try to understand something better about this world or law in general or justice? Well, um, I, I should say that uh, my selection of legal profession came um, in a way um, as a mixture of friendly advice of my uh, dear mother and uh, also my that time girlfriend. I must say that they both tricked me into the profession of law for the very simple reason that uh, my major during my high school and my utmost interest uh, during that time was in history. And uh, indeed, uh, I could say that uh, my understanding of history and, and following historic events shaped my also today's professional approach uh, to, to many uh, practical matters. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, they, they suggested that why don't I go for an uh, entrance exams to the, to the law school. Uh, if I want, I could continue with studies. If I don't want to continue, I could resort back to the history, my, my original interest. Um, but of course, uh, that was not the only reason. Uh, the time I uh, graduated my high school was 1989. And as you could see, that was a revolutionary turnover moment momentum for a part of the world, for Eastern Europe, for Soviet Union, and, and definitely, most definitely for the Baltic states, because in, since 1987 until 1990, the Baltic states were, um, in a way, in a center, in an epicenter of tectonic movement, of turning back to uh, our independence, regaining back our independence, uh, turning into the, uh, turning back, getting closer again to the world uh, of, of democracy on, and of freedom. But speaking on particular books, um, I think uh, one can find inspiration in many interesting uh, literary sources. You could start with the trivia. You could start with good detective stories where you always will find a good hero. And not always that is an uh, obscure detective or intellectual uh, talent, uh, talented genius. It quite often could also be um, um, a lawyer uh, properly doing the daily tasks, to kill the mockingbird, to take an example, a popular literature example. Or you could also um, go and see for uh, um, what else I could find. Let me see. You know, it's, it's, for lawyers, it's quite difficult because we're not uh, fond of, uh, when we start practicing, we're not anymore uh, reading about law. For one simple, uh, I mean, literature about law, for a simple reason that um, uh, we see in our daily practice, in our daily uh, case flow, we see such a unique situations that you find literature slightly boring. And you could never imagine the things that we uh, come up with <laughs> during our daily practice would really happen. If we, if we put that on paper, no reader would believe. They would be saying, well, you are making this whole thing up. But that, unfortunately or fortunately, is not true. And that is one of the prime reasons why the profession of law is so interesting and why there are so many colleagues of mine who are still practicing in their 70s and even 80s. So that is a profession you could really live with, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She stayed as a judge until her last day. I mean, this is such an inspirational example. Why? Because the law is a universal approach to many, many things in the world. And, and while being in law, while being in practice of law, you could certainly revive your interest about uh, the world uh, around you. I think the profession of law is also very linked to morality and philosophical discussions as such. So I think that's why perhaps it's so appealing to many people, because you can think all the time and, and try to interpret texts and then and, and try to, you know, I, th I don't know, link many concepts together. Absolutely. And uh, I would definitely be over-exaggerating, uh, suggesting that I've been uh, to a large extent ins inspired by legal philosophers. But nevertheless, there are also uh, really great sources uh, in the uh, theory of law, uh, in philosophy of law, that give you a, a right direction. I would not probably, probably recommend to start with uh, any of uh, those sources, for instance, um, Hans Kelsen or Herbert Louis Hart, who've been uh, the major uh, players, major influencers in the 20th century philosophy, or um, uh, Judge Posner uh, of a modern day um, legal uh, philosophy. But nevertheless, when you are in the law and when you are f trying to find your inspiration, when you are trying to find your direction, you could certainly uh, go also into the theory of law. And again, I would need to emphasize, probably because of me being part of uh, University of Latvia uh, Department of Legal Theory and Legal History, I would need to emphasize importance of history. That also shapes not only uh, political uh, life, not only social developments, but, but history also gives revelations about development of uh, justice, development of law. Uh, let's take uh, the, the rules of Hammurabi. They are thousands of years ago adopted by first ancient civilizations, and still a number of these rules live uh, up to now, till today. Yeah, and uh, this is very interesting because I've been wondering um, 
And I think in all law schools, teachers, lecturers touch upon this aspect, how a law and morals go hand in hand, or they are, are they different concepts because there are different kind of theories that approach these questions. And I started to wonder, do you, as a legal in your legal practice for more than 20 years, have you ever had a situation when there is a case which there's a, where there's a judgment and you see that, yes, it is, it is legal, but it is immoral? And if, 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 it, if it's not in your practice, it may be some of your foreign colleagues have shared. Absolutely. Many, many such examples, as you have uh, rightly quoted, uh, that is actually one of the greatest uh, tragedies of legal profession of 20th century where you see uh, that these conflicts between what is right and what is just are in contradiction to what is prescribed by imperative rules uh, of law. Uh, the best example for, probably would be to go back to the 1949 uh, Nuremberg Tribunal which has also been, uh, it is a historical event of legal history, but it has also been colorfully depicted in a Hollywood uh, movie where uh, judges, uniquely enough, judges of uh, Hitler's Germany had been tried for applying unjust, inhumane law. So judges had been acting in accordance with the strict formal rules of positive law because that is the dominating doctrine for centuries, that you, the judge is merely, as Montesquieu put it, a mouth of law, the one who puts law into practice, applies the particular norms to specific actual situations. However, one of the important lessons of tragedies, historic tragedies of the 20th century is that judge should also be, first and foremost, a human being a personality who can distinguish between the law that is just and therefore shall be applied and law, the rules of law, the, the norms that are not just and therefore should not be applied. And I guess one of the uh, illustrious examples, uh, striking examples that it still is the case relates to the definition of family. Uh, in the modern day Latvian legal parlance and also in, in the turbulent times of, of, of this year, 2020. And if I may expand on this, I think that uh, our constitutional court, uh, Satvers Mestiesa, has uh, made a historic decision, as a matter of fact, a number of historic decisions. We're, of course, discussing in public those which are perhaps relating to more, more um, controversial uh, interpretations of concepts, but uh, in 2020, uh, Latvian Constitutional Court has uh, resorted back to those basic rules of human rights, to the basic rights of humans, uh, a rights of dignity, respect to a uh, human person, both in relation to a number of judgments during the summer of 2020, when the Constitutional Court has um, uh, reviewed uh, our uh, ombudsman's, uh, Tiesi uh, um requests to um, review whether the government uh, imposed uh, minimum wage or minimum um, uh, social benefit uh, amount and threshold is appropriate. And in those judgments, as well as in later judgment in relation to the uh, rights of uh, uh, family of, uh, of two persons of the same gender, constitutional court has effectively emphasized the importance that those norms of positive law should always be applied in looking back at the most important rule of the society, of the state, a respect to a human being, respect to basic rights of a human being. And I think uh, this is a, a historic event. We do realize it now. We see also what, uh, a what a discussion these uh, judgment had started. And uh, let me conclude that first of all, uh, this will be a, a, an important turning point uh, for also Latvian courts because constitutional court judgments are um, binding to courts and to institutions. But another very important feature to take away from, from this historic year in the uh, practice of constitutional court is uh, the emphasis on a judge as a human being and a judge 
as a person of courage. So uh, in order to take these decisions, in order to go against the government's set thresholds and, and social benefits, you have to have a courage. Because in a way, you are shaking the existing system, the existing understanding, which is wrong, of course. But still, you have to have a courage. My question then is, if, you need, if, if a judge needs courage, I completely agree with this, right? I think a judge needs courage when they try to decide a, a case. But should judge have a courage in the sense that they go out of the court and have like a public personality and try to explain these judgments? And to what extent, perhaps? There's a major change in uh, perception of a judge in society. Uh, major respect, a huge respect to judges has always been there. So starting again, going back to Hammurabi code, and since centuries, judges had always been part of uh, a social elite, not only of legal elite, so it's the, the top legal profession by all means, but it is also part of intellectual elite, part of elite of any country. However, if judges' position has been so far, for the majority of, of human history, been treated as the one who knows laws and who interprets laws, who applies laws, and being just in this activity. Today, judge takes a more decisive role. Uh, to some extent, uh, in legal doctrine that is criticized in uh, applying a term uh, judicial activism, mm -hmm. which has negative connotations in that sense that judges should not take over role of legislators. But these, of course, will be specific uh, debatable cases. But overall, what we could see in European, um, continental European tradition, where judges had been part of a system, yeah. uh, legal system, today judges in many countries had risen above simply being part of a legal system. Judges become a major personalities. Well, you could see some uh, clear examples, of course, that is a different legal tradition, a different role of judge in society as in the United States or in England, uh, where uh, judicial role has always been, uh, in a way, more a personality role than one of the system, uh, such as Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But you could also see that in countries uh, closer to Latvia, uh, in times of crisis, importance of a judicial position is rising enormously. Take Poland, take Hungary, where judges had been forced to go out of their comfort of their meeting rooms, comfort of their uh, libraries, comfort of their legal doctrines. They have to go out and they have to become part of a, a public movement. Uh, that said, I would not be critical to that. I think that this is a very important message that uh, something obviously is wrong in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the social fabric. So if uh, you see Poland, where unfortunately European uh, Union institutions and the Court of Justice of European Union had to be intervening into the setup of Constitutional Court of Poland and setup of a, a legal system, a judicial system in Poland, then this is clearly a sign that something is totally wrong. And same is true for any jurisdiction, because judges are personalities. And judges, of course, are speaking. Predominantly, judges are speaking via their judgments. They are speaking via their rulings. And to some extent, they also um, can explain themselves via their academical careers. And I'm very happy that we do have many judges who are also in academical world. But in the same time, sometimes judges, I must say so, are forced to go out in a social debate and to participate in social debate. Uh, I, would, I would say that uh, in the situation that has been created now in Latvia, that is a very powerful and a very positive signal. That shows that judges are also human beings who understand very well the difference be be between justice and injustice. And I would like to take a, a bit step back from judges and pay closer attention to the previous question we uh, mentioned in you. I touched upon uh, constitutional uh, cases uh, which uh, took place this year and um, judgments and, and there was this case about same-sex uh, marriages and in Latvia as we know there is uh, not legally uh, accepted as uh, having these unions and there are countries in the EU who has uh, already 30 or 40 years ago uh, accepted these as Denmark and um, 
I would like to ask you, what is uh, what is the reason why do you think it is this way in Latvia that there's this clash and division between people? And I, I, I would say that there are three groups of people mainly, those who do not support, those who support, and those who say uh, that they they can legally be married but they don't they can't have children and uh, what is your opinion about this whole situation whether it's going to change in the next 10 20 years all right well um i'm very i'm very happy to uh, get into this discussion because uh, over the past months i've been very actively taking part into this uh, movement so i am not a neutral observer that is first important note uh, to say but there's also one clarification, an important clarification to make. The reason, uh, the recent statistical polls uh, dating um, uh, October 2020 indicate that majority of Latvian people do not object against same-sex marriage couples living together and having their legal rights provided by law. My question then is, but is supporting the same as not objecting? Well, uh, the there, is a, there, is a, there is a difference. There's a thin line, of course. Mm -hmm. But what is important, uh, we see that this is a matter of uh, a, a noisy debate for a uh, prime reason that Latvia is still in this process of transforming from the post-totalitarian system in which you deny even situations that are far more normal, far more uh, real than a same-sex marriage a very positive prohibition. System, yeah. Yes, of course, you see, exactly, approach to law is positivistic. You have to have everything prescribed by law. Everything that is not prescribed is either in gray zone or predominantly illegal. So you act as in any totalitarian system. People are looking on what is right to some higher authorities. They are looking mm -hmm. at, the, at the Communist Party. They are looking at the government. And if the government send, says, for instance, if the government says, wear masks, you do wear masks. But if the government doesn't say, don't wear masks, people don't kind of think about it. I mean, I mean, in, in any uh, sort of uh, in, in a society where people are uh, thinking of themselves, they, they should come to this decision that you need a mask. When you start reading about consequences of what happens when you don't read a face mask in the times of pandemic, you don't need the government's warning. And if the government, to some extent or for some reason, is delaying this rule for one week, it doesn't mean that you should delay equally. You have your own brain. You have to think about it. And of course, you have to be very careful and very cautious um, in, in modern times about uh, the public information, because there are so many uh, not only fake news, but so-called deep fakes that in a way make you believe that a person has said something that he or she has not absolutely uttered. But going back to your question, indeed there's a thin line between accepting something positively or not, ob not objecting. Majority of Latvian people in accordance with the public polls do not object that legal rights should be prescribed. That is, a legislator should take active steps in putting down it on, 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 on the uh, codes of law. However, um, legislator has, uh, for more than six times since 1999, rejected any requests, any pleas, and even popular initiatives that uh, have collected more than 10,000 uh, signatures. Uh, that, that is a threshold for you to start a legal initiative, and, 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 and the parliament is obliged to review these requests. So there have been these requests numerous times, and it seems that in 2020 we have reached the point of no return. So this is the moment in which you cannot anymore go back. The legislator cannot say, well, this is an interest only of a small minority part of population, and therefore the majority should not take due care of it. Let's again shelve it. Let's forget about it. If the Constitutional Court has come out and said you cannot put it on shelf anymore. You have to deal with it. There is a deadline to it. It's June the 1st, 2022, by which date the parliament and the government should prescribe a precise uh, set of rules that protects same-sex uh, couples. You cannot uh, use the term marriage because in Latvia the constitutional amendments dating back to 2006 had restricted the term marriage to the heterosexual 
uh, couples only, so to men and to women. However, you have an open worded definition of family in our civil law that allows you to interpret uh, the social reality, the fact of two people li living together, to interpret it as a family. And this is exactly the course that the European Court of Human Rights has done since uh, mid-80s in 20th century. So you see that there is a, a, a tradition, and of course, truth to be told, European uh, Court of Human Rights, of course, is referring to a national tradition of each country. It refers to rules in each country, and we can see that in France and in Germany, for instance, you have uh, same-sex couples can um, arrange their life uh, as a marriage and enjoy the same rights as any uh, married people do. In Latvia, similarly as in other countries where you have this restriction of a family being narrowly defined as a, a relationship or cohabition of two uh, people of different sex, in Latvia you have to resort to other instruments and that is not complicated because uh, the recent initiative that is again ready to be handed into parliament suggests that you have to uh, legally provide registration for same-sex couples, couples for their cohabition, which is uh, a lengthy, uh, purposeful. You have common property. You may also have children, and you're right. Uh, that is another hot topic if uh, same-sex couples shall be allowed for adoption. However, I believe that at this point of time in Latvia, there is no such definition. We talk about basics. We talk about the, the, the prime things that might seem natural to uh, a younger generation, to those who are in their 20s and 30s, but to those who've lived through the Soviet Union and who lived through that tradition, they may still regard. So my generation might still look at this issue with a bit of uh, prejudice. There's something foreign, in a sense. Well, yes, but on the, on the other hand, uh, there's a very interesting uh, book by a uh, historian, uh, Dr. Ineta Lipsche, who has described the uh, same-sex couples living in, in Latvia for more than 100 years. So this is what the European Court of Human Rights defines it as a social reality. It's a fact of reality, and now there's a time to stop ignoring it, to provide certain rights to, to those people who are living together. Yeah. I've noticed that there is also a tendency that politicians and people come out of the closet, as uh, they like to put it. And uh, I, I think that it also outlines, you know, this critical point that there is a turn of events and people are not as scarce as they used to be about the fact, yes, I am. And, um, and there is this one aspect I would like to touch upon. Is, is it possible, and I think it is, that it is the case, that they are scared to acknowledge publicly and to state that I am because there's this a large judgment by the society as there was one case when uh, a guy with his other half who was also a guy they went I think it was Tangarax and they were uh, attacked Yes, and well, this is a, a gruesome event. This is a very unfortunate situation with Professor Hanov. Uh, Professor Dr. Hanov is a famous intellectual personality. He is, uh, he's done so much uh, good work uh, for Latvian culture and history of culture uh, exploration. So I, I'm deeply saddened by what happened uh, in, 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 uh, in that unfortunate event a few weeks ago. Uh, you are right. Uh, predominantly, the society would be neutral, and I believe that um, even if seeing that uh, two uh, partners of the same sex are together, there would not be a major aggressive outcry. Uh, people would be accepting uh, this relationship. Indeed, uh, of course, there are certain situations and certain uh, places where dangers can be higher and where this aggression could spill out. What I am afraid of, that this debate, which was um, also explored by the Constitutional Court, may raise, um, among other uh, elements, it may raise also aggression. It may raise also negative approach to those people who are different. And this is a topic that is always puzzling me. Why people who are uh, living their lives, why they feel uh, that they are in danger because other people who are different, who live in 
same lives, but they live it differently. What is so wrong with that? Why should you be feeling endangered of that? It's, it's a great puzzlement to me, and probably because of lack of my um, uh, knowledge in psychology, in so social psychology, I might not uh, understand it. I would still qualify it as a part of a stigma, where the society has its old standing views on many things, and uh, the question is whether you need to change them. And my answer is yes, because if there are unhappy people who are not respected because of this only one element of their personality, then this is wrong. In a modern day society, you should accept diversity. You should accept that people are different. And uh, that is uh, also quite an interesting fact when preparing to this constitutional court case, I was looking also at the economical, at the business aspect of those societies or those communities that accept same-sex uh, marriages, same-sex uh, couples. And uh, no, to no surprise, those countries who do accept, who are more tolerant to homosexual people living together and granting rights of same-sex uh, partners, those societies are thriving economically. Of course, you could look at the causal relationship. What yeah. comes first? Yeah. Better economy bringing to more tolerance or uh, more Human tolerance rights, yeah. brings in people who are different, who feel safer. Uh, my friends who are flocking to Berlin because they feel uh, more accepted in Berlin. If, if, if they are homosexuals, they, they feel that this is the place to be because there they can live, they can uh, do their work, and they can contribute to that uh, community. Same is true for, and as, as an example, in U.S. cities, you would look at the cities that are more acceptable, like San Francisco and New York. And again, the question is on causality, but this is an important correlation. Better life, more, uh, more uh, sort of growth, and respect and tolerance uh, to difference. To some people it might seem uh, a part of a normality, but for some people it still is, is, is it's a long way to go. So unfortunately this debate will not stop uh, in, in the society, I believe. I think this, uh, the, the specific case uh, which you were a part uh, of, I think was also very important because it didn't uh, only touch upon the rights of same-sex couples, but also the rights of children, right? Perhaps you could comment on this part of, uh, of the judgment, which would be interesting to the listeners. You are quite right. Um, one of the, uh, there were two major uh, stepping stones for the Constitutional Court to come up with, uh, with the judgment as it is uh, in, in this case. One, we had discussed it, is the human dignity. Mm -hmm. Respect to human dignity that is enshrined in both the Declaration of Human Rights, the Convention on Human Rights, it's a part of any society, it's a basis of society. But the Constitutional Court also look at this particular case and they were viewing rights to uh, partners that are granted to uh, different sex couples with the purpose of protecting families and helping children mm -hmm. during first days of their lives. So when you have a children, when a child comes in the family, both parents have to be present. And, uh, and again, as a matter of reality, we see that there are very many couples, also in Latvia, where the same-sex parents are together with children. One could, of course, say, well, how could they have children? Well, it's a matter of fact that also um, many families that have uh, different gender parents cannot biologically have children. So they have to either adopt mm -hmm. or they have to use in vitro fertilization mechanisms. Similarly, also same-sex uh, couples are having children. This is reality. This is not prohibited. This is not against the law. This is reality. And those children have to be protected. So what the uh, Constitutional Court did, and this is of course not the first such decision in the jurisprudence of Constitutional Court, but in this case Constitutional Court again emphasized that in society rights of children are a priority. This is a very important concept. And you have to look at those families and you have to ask a simple question. If granting of the benefits, social benefits, and in this case it was a 10-day free uh, break from your yeah. work regime. Uh, you have 10-day holiday paid by the state. Can you grant it also to the same-sex couple? And the question of the court was, if that benefited a child to whom these holidays, uh, holidays are related, then of course yes. 
because this is better for a child. A child is living with two parents, and both parents have to be uh, treated in such, both parents have to uh, now transform their lives, their work habits, in such a manner that the child is a uh, priority. And, and this is, of course, emphasized by the Constitutional Court. Also, a similar question about rights was about mothers' rights, right, to, to be supported in these kind of days. And, and uh, is there another separate aspect, or would you say it's a very closely tied just to, just to the children's rights? Rights of mother are important, and if we remember uh, Dostoevsky's uh, Anna Karenina, we know that uh, because of med medical reasons, uh, it is a very difficult time for uh, a mother who is uh, during the, the period of expecting a child and also mm -hmm. uh, immediately after childbirth. So a partner should always be present. The partner should support mother. That is another, of course linked, but important per se uh, rule yeah. that has also been supported by the Constitutional Court judgment. Uh, my next question is uh, going into a direction of today's society as like in general there has always been wars warfare military uh, uh, cooperate uh, military cooperation between different states then there was uh, in uh, Roman times there was uh, <laughs> when the church started to work together with uh, the uh, state and today there is this notion that so many states have become democratic, but there's still warfare is happening in other states. And there comes the notion of peace. Um, and peace against justice. And which is more important in your opinion? Because Martin Luther has said that peace comes before all the justice. And how do you see that? Well, um, yet another tough question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me start with the reference to um, uh, a suggestion of one of my uh, friends, my good colleagues, uh, a lawyer from Moscow, who visited me a few years ago in summer, and when in one of those late evening debates he uttered the phrase that I have not thought about before, he suggested that uh, Europe, uh, European Union in particular, is a, unique, um, is a unique organization, and you, Europeans, should protect it as much as you can. Hence, his reasoning was because Europe has never, most part of Europe has never lived in peace for such a long time in its entire history. There's, there've always been either local wars or unfortunately regional or even continental size of wars. Mm -hmm. And now these years after the end of the Second World War, and creation of European Economical Community and further on the European Union, you have created a continental, a pan-continental agreement that you would probably go down with your local national ambitions to some extent. You would make certain compromises um, in relation to the major European countries for the benefit of, uh, of, a, of a peace on a continent. And of course, improvement of the legal position and improvement of rights of those smaller countries that had been all over the history, all of the time, that had not been always respected. So it, the, the uh, phrase of my friend, of my Russian friend then, is still a, an important um, perspective how to look at the European Union, that this is a, an institution that is created for uh, maintaining of a permanent peace uh, that benefits, in particular benefits, smaller nations mm -hmm. as Latvia. And of course, um, well, he's not alone in, in suggesting this. We see that uh, there are many scholars who are looking at the European Union project as um, um, an extension of uh, idea of Immanuel Kant, that the permanent peace can be achieved by international trade. So a very pragmatic approach of, of this Königsberg uh, philosopher to, uh, who lives, in a way, in an outskirts of, of, yeah. of uh, the western part of Europe, who suggests that uh, Europe, uh, or the world for that uh, sake, can um, live in a permanent peace if there is an interest, if there is an economical interest. What it means that you also have to balance your trade relationships on a compromise. You have to balance them on, uh, on a notion of justice because no party will enter into a trade arrangement if the party will not feel that this is a just arrangement. So let me therefore link 
peace with a justice. And peace can never be permanent and it can never be long lasting if there is no justice in the uh, arrangement of how this peace shall be maintained. Take an example of uh, Versailles Treaty and uh, the consequences of uh, an unjust treaty in that sense uh, after the uh, end of the First World War. What happened? There was a, 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 a resentment. There was, yes, exactly, reparations. There was a huge burden to those losing countries who, of course, uh, wanted to take revenge. Just, uh, when I was listening to your uh, answer, I just started to um, uh, have like small pieces of information together from the lecture I'm having in Roman law and how Charles Magne cooperated with the uh, church. And then they were having mutual benefit at that point. And there was peace b and because it was in both of their interests to be, peace, uh, to be in peace. And then centuries went by and the church wanted to be independent from the state and the emperors had to fight with the church for the domination because they wanted to be uh, dominant and then the peace was not the main interest anymore. Well, yeah, you're right. Uh, to some extent, paradoxically, peace can be achieved also by uh, a powerful and uh, uh, passive threats as uh, during the times of Cold War. But you could look back at the history of, of our uh, native dear Riga city that has been created in a way as a cohabition, coexistence of many divergent, different powers. Uh, look at the uh, German uh, order and the Catholic Church. Look at the local tribes. There's been always uh, then uh, a growing city with its own powers to the extent that it was able to negotiate a particular autonomous situation for itself in the Russian Empire. That is, again, a, a unique example in history that uh, peace can be achieved also by means of having a strong, strong being prepared to war. So that's an, another famous saying uh, that uh, if you want peace, get prepared to war. Peace also has this kind of a spillover effect, right? If, if Europe is peaceful, then probably the neighboring countries also are peaceful. So it's a, it also has this kind of a positive effect uh, outwards, right? And in, 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 the, in the sense that it promotes more peace if there is some kind of a peaceful entity in the world. Yes and no. You're, you're right that uh, you have a good example to follow, but on the other hand, we can see that there are territories, there are continents where uh, from time to time there is unrest, and the unrest can also be, uh, you could look back and see why, for instance, there are regions in Africa that uh, you have a permanent unrest, and this is a matter of justice because there is an unjust distribution of uh, wealth, unjust uh, arrangements between uh, various uh, tribal interests, for interests, or for 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 example, yeah, or or uh, the, the uh, we see more and more now when the archives are opening up that some of the commercial entities are, have been playing dirty games. They've been on a purpose making uh, wars, local wars, in order to benefit commercially. And this is again another uh, issue on on how. Uh, this prosperous part of the world sometimes is playing by totally different rules when it comes uh, to different uh, systems, when it comes to different countries. Mm -hmm. We're talking about this question of peace in, in the context of, you know, military. Uh, like if there are, you know, they're in conflict, the states, and there's this justice aspect. But how about today, 21st century, we have so many fake news. We have social media wars. And... You know, at that point, um, there's also this notion of corruption because some of the magazines are owned by private entities. And where, where is the justice there? Why, why are there um, no uh, judgment of the justice and morality of the public figures, the journals uh, having uh, spreading the fake news so much. Where's, how, did, uh, how did it puts in the context of that? Well, I believe that uh, there are a number of reasons why we are in the situation of uh, a, 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 a very fragmented media world and also very, rather many conflicting views and uh, abundance of information. Uh, there are a number of uh, 
reasons why uh, we are in the situation. First of all, it is a major technological advancement that has taken us uh, in the course of the past 20 or so years. As a result, we are now very much dependent on our technologies, on our devices, channeling to us particular type of information and bringing us to one or to another conclusion, uh, preparing us for, for those conclusions. Uh, manipulation via these devices, manipulation via selecting, segregating information, and also by creating certain in informational contexts seem to be so easy uh, done that now it obviously is part of uh, today's routine. Whenever we are coming to a, a major political event, such as elections or major decisions uh, taken, we see that there always is this information, uh, invisible informational warfare that prepares to that, this to us. And it, of course, and I am a great optimist in, in many areas, also including this uh, issue, and I believe that this is exactly like... Uh, uh, immunity that works. If we live through an illness and if we are happy enough to survive, there is an Im immunity. Now we learn about COVID that there is a three to five month immunity and unfortunately there is a, s a possibility that we get ill again until the vaccines come. So same is true also for this informational warfare, that if we at once um, enter into this game and if we realize later that we've been defrauded or we've been manipulated, we will be much more careful next time when another such occasion will happen. So, for instance, when we had been defrauded by a deep fake, looking that our favorite hero, our favorite politician, is saying total rubbish, total nonsense, and later, and, and we of course are disappointed, and, and we are not happy, and are not voting for him or her anymore, later on we realize that this was just a, a professionally made fake. So this is totally wrong. Next time, we will not trust, even we will not trust our own eyes, our own ears. We will double check this information, we will look for sources, we will think about the context, and we may, it might take a bit longer time, but we, we may come to the truthful decision. So um, I think to some extent your suggestion that we are in this situation is a bit of a race. It, it was exactly like in 1950s where the first atomic bombs were, in 1940s, 1950s, where first atomic bombs were created, Project Manhattan in New York, equally uh, a powerful project in the, Uni in the Soviet Union. Uh, the atomic race started. There was no morality because everyone thought, every nation thought about its own interests. China, uh, United States, Soviet Union, further on, other atomic uh, superpowers. They understood, I believe, that this is not good, that they are creating world to be a very dangerous place because atomic weapons are far more uh, dangerous than everything that has been used in warfare before that. But in the same time, their uh, justification of this movement was this is for the sake of our own nation. And see, I think there's something similar in what we are now into this in informational warfare situation. Russian hackers, do you think that they are sitting by their tables and considering, let's just be evil guys, evil, evil, evil guys? I don't think so. I think about Russia as a superpower which is neglected. So they have to f take it back. They have to fight for it. They have to uh, tell Latvians that, uh, that their country is poor because they disrespect Russia. So I believe, I deeply believe that everyone who is engaged in, in this informational war is to some extent driven by some good deeds. Of course there are commercial players always and that's a totally different thing. This is uh, a profit uh, margin issue. But for many people who are there, uh, there they, they might even be playing genuine game. And now for us as an objective viewers, as those who are targeted by these information flows, it's important to realize even if they are genuine, even if they are trying their best to convince us whether they are right. So it's our judgment. I wanted to perhaps touch upon more personal, your kind of uh, routine issues now. Firstly, what is really interesting in my opinion is that you are, I think, an image of a healthy person. You run, right? You also swim in, even in cold weather, right? Where do you, I think, find the motivation to do this all? Uh, how has it benefited you? How can you all even manage all this with your workload? 
Well, um, I'll go back to my teenage years when in grade four, my uh, great uh, teacher, uh, our headmistress, wrote in my uh, diary for my parents a note, too much energy. Not always appropriate. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I have to say that it still is the case. I, I am uh, having um, lots of energy. I am um, Overall, I am quite an optimistic person. I'm looking at every event that happens to me, every even calamity that I'm into. Uh, I'm looking at it uh, thinking, well, there's some good lesson. And probably this is for the uh, more uh, general cause. My bike was stolen a few weeks ago. <laughs> wow. Yes, the lock was cut uh, in the night time. Of course, I could say, well, it was my blame. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be leaving it uh, uh, near my office building uh, night, overnight. Yeah. But my bike was taken away. It was uh, very dear to me. It was more than 10 years. And, um, but then I thought a few days I was in mourning. But then I thought, well, this is a great opportunity to look at uh, what new has happened in the biking industry. That's amazing. <laughs> That's and a really great way. How yes, so I this. have a new bike now, <laughs> and I'm happy that uh, this is uh, this is clearly a better bike. And uh, mm -hmm. yesterday I did my ride from uh, Yurmala, where I live, to Riga in one hour and ten minutes, and now I have a. Um, I, I believe that I can achieve these 25 kilometers within one hour. This okay. is realistic. So mm -hmm. wait and see. Next, next, <laughs> uh, next. Uh, next year perhaps I will be able to achieve it but I have to say that um, um, and again going back to Marcus Aurelius uh, that you quoted in the beginning of our conversation um, you have to be uh, th there's this, this holistic approach to things you cannot expect that you will be served you cannot yeah. expect that you could sit back and wait until things will happen around you you have to be yourself part of it and you have to live the life that you are satisfied with and, and my lifestyle would require being uh, active, moving around, not using any medicine. I must admit that uh, I'm not anti-vaxxer. I am <laughs> using vaccines, but I have not used any antibiotics for, for many, many years. I haven't been ill for many, many years, and I believe this is because I'm trying to live the life which mm -hmm. I enjoy. And if I like swimming, I will swim through the year. Would you say that there is this kind of, a, I don't know, discipline or motivation in yourself that, uh, I don't know, allows you to step in that you know cold shower or step in that cold uh, sea well undeniably well at, at one moment you think why i'm doing this and then you try to convince you rationally well because uh, you strengthen your immunity and you will feel much better then that is true you feel absolutely excellent after you get out of the sea <laughs> but important part is that you have to say to yourself you can do it and uh, of course uh, Willpower is uh, also an element in all this fight. Uh, it's, a, it's a fight against oneself. And uh, also an important thing is not to over-exaggerate. I have to say that I started marathon running. Um, I run my first marathon at the age of 39. Before that, I've done long, long distances. I've been training du during the high school, and I also did half marathons when I was in my 20s. But then for about 10 years, I did nothing. I concentrated on my intellectual work primarily. And since then, I have to say that I, I, I do feel better now because um, you need to balance. You need to balance both your intellectual work and also your physical activity. It contributes mutually. And the next question, as we are in the RGSL chat chamber, it is uh, of importance to outline what is your involvement with RGSL? Well, I have to say that RGSL is a, a fantastic school. This is really a unique school that has been created back in 1999. And since the day one, when the preparation for the school was started, I was in that process, and I'm very proud of being part of it since the first day. I was uh, involved as assistant uh, lecturer to Professor uh, Sue Bench, professor from uh, University of Texas, who uh, started within the Fulbright program to um, develop the program of legal ethics. Uh, legal ethics and professional regulation was the name of the course that was uh, commenced at the first day of the school in 2020. And um, it was, uh, the, uh, it was uh, a course that at that time seemed to be very theoretical because in Europe, and in particular 
in, in the Baltic states, no such course was taught before, mm -hmm. and there were no examples of a real life uh, cases. So we took a US regulation and US courses. We looked at the regulation of the Baltic uh, bar associations and Baltic uh, judges of Baltic countries, and we also looked at the uh, CZBE code of justice that is still valid, the European uh, code for, for lawyers. And we developed the course uh, as uh, an idealistic tool for young lawyers to approach their practice of law. And I think that this has been also uh, part of ethos of RGSL that you not only look at international law, you not only look at the practical courses that you could apply, you also look and ask the question why and how. You look at the practice of law as an art, you look at the practice of law as the way how you live through your life, uh, going back to your thesis of uh, Marcus Aurelius, you live your life with the satisfaction that you do the right thing. Then also, I think perhaps the last question then. Yeah. A question, uh, a suggestion perhaps, uh, but uh, what would you like to suggest, comment, or um, like that people take, uh, take for them? when they uh, listen to this podcast. Uh, perhaps they are students, perhaps they're just peers of RGSL, but what would be your suggestion or some kind of a comment? Well, I have to say that uh, the history of RGSL is uh, a really learning example of how the school, which has been created with one certain purpose, to educate not only Latvian students, but international students, and to show them the best of what uh, legal education can give, how with this aim, with this purpose, the school has lived through different times, different contexts, and also challenging times. And I think that uh, example of RGSL is uh, as a long-standing and a really good school is uh, quite a learning one. So that also could be extrapolated to all our lives that uh, we have our own aims, we have our own uh, interests, and we always have to maintain the most important part of it, irrespective of how difficult the life is and what we are meeting in, in, in the course of our lives. Thank you. So I think we can conclude our conversation now. I think this was very valuable, and, and I think I hope that listeners will enjoy it as well. Yeah, because we did. This was uh, very nice to talk to you. Thank you. Um, and uh, let me thank you for your inspiring questions. And to many of them, I will still have to think about <laughs> the right answers even after our conversation. Well, and, um, and yes, thank you very much. And uh, I wish you good luck. Yeah, so listeners, Lauri, thank you. Stay safe during these difficult times of COVID. So bye-bye.